What's crack? Big dose. Welcome bike to the channel. Welcome bike to the headquarters. My name is Nicholas. This is BDGE. Big dogs got to eat. And today, today we are getting into players where the fate has simply gone too far. Okay. You, 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 you sat down in the barber's chair and he went from top of the head. He went past the sideburns, past the beard. He's giving you a fade into the fucking neck, into the nipple area, okay? These players, the fade has gone too far. There's been too much negative scrutiny around these guys to the point where they're becoming good values in fantasy football, okay? And I'm going to run through this video rather quickly because I have a very busy day. had a very busy day yesterday, hence why this video is coming out late. And we're going to do this in, in one take, okay? One take. Love that. Name a TV show, an episode where that came from. And uh, I'm going to give away a free draft guide for that. Five players, maybe seven players, I forget how many I have on my list, in which the fade has gone too far in 2021 fantasy football. Maybe we don't love them, okay? There's a reason that we're, they were probably being faded to begin with, but the hate, the hate has simply gone too far, and we don't discriminate here at BDGE. With that being said, we're going to tuck our shirts in. We're going to stop yelling and let's eat. And because I'm not editing this, I got to do this all by hand. All that ass, Lord of mercy, all that champagne, these bitches thirsty. Let's go. All right. Uh, if you're new to the channel, by the way, it would be fantastic if you subscribed. We're trying to blow up to about 100 billion subscribers this summer. We are on pace to not even eclipse 0.0001% of that. But it'd be cool if you stuck around because we're doing fantasy football videos every single day. Hit the thumbs up button too if you enjoy the video at any point. All right, we're going to go uh, position by position here. And there's pretty much one guy at each position. We might have double dipped into a couple different spots. The first guy on this list in which the fade has gone too far is Cam Newton, bro. Wham, bam, Superman, Cam Newton. Hear me out. Hear me out. He's going off the board as a quarterback, 31. The 30 fucking first quarterback off the board in fantasy football right now. All right? No one deserves to go at the 31st spot. You need to be a bet. Jordan Love, actually, Jordan Love deserves to go at like the 41st spot, even as a starting quarterback for the Packers. But, but Cam Newton has the 31st quarterback right now. Yes, he was awful in the passing game last year, okay? I get that. He had literally nobody to throw the ball to. I don't expect what, I don't know what you expected to happen with a quarterback that was playing in a run first system with all new weapons, completely new everything. Everything was new there. And there was no, nothing, nothing for Cam to throw the ball to. Now there is. Now we switched up the tempo. We brought in Hunter Henry. We brought in Jonah Smith. We've seen this offense be very effective with two tight ends. They bring in Nelson Aguilar. They bring in uh, Kendrick Bourne, I guess. But when you start to put the pieces together, you're starting to look at a, a an, an okay offense, right? They have... Much better weapons. We hit the upgrade button on that. We smashed it this offseason. So Cam actually has players to throw the ball to when he's under pressure, when instead of running the ball every time, he can actually trust that some of his playmakers are going to make plays with the ball in their hands. Their line is also very, very good, okay? Their offensive line entering 2021, entering this year per PFF, is the third, the third highest ranked offensive line in the NFL. It's going to be good for Cam. It's going to be great for for, for Damian Harris. The other thing, too, is like, it wasn't all bad for Cam Newton last year, okay? He had some bright spots. Deep ball completion percentage, despite what his arm looked like, it looked like a piece of angel hair. And people gave him a lot of shit for it. Fourth highest deep ball completion percentage. Didn't do it often, but when he did, he really wasn't that bad. Pressured completion percentage. Number four in the NFL, okay? So there are a few a few positives to take away from, uh, from this. And when you look at Cam, I mean, it, again, it'll be his second year in the offense. He's still going to score a ton of rushing touchdowns this year. And I simply think he's not as bad as people are making him out to be in fantasy football. Like, he was a great late-round pick last year because he has that rushing upside. The man played in 15 games last year, and he had 23.6 or more fantasy points in five of them. Okay? That's a huge number. So a third of his games, including games of 25.7, 29.6, 35.6. Like, the upside is very real for Cam Newton here on a weekly basis. Uh, and the obvious elephant in the room here is Mac Jones, 15th pick overall. I don't think that they are going to throw Mac Jones right into this system. It's a difficult system to learn. 
He wasn't, you know, the first, second, or third pick off the board. You don't have to shove him right into a starting role. I think this is, I, I think Cam has a much stronger grip on this job than most people realize at this point. And I think Cam is under center for at least, at least 10 weeks this season, okay? And you're drafting him at the quarterback 31, which means you get him as your quarterback three. In Superflex, you get him as a late, 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 late round pick in one quarterback leagues. Like in best ball leagues, you're literally getting him in the 17th or 18th round right now in underdog. And I think that's ridiculous value considering the weekly upside that he gives you. Even last year with no weapons, again, he had games of over 23.6 fantasy points five separate times, all right? That is huge. That's getting into your lineup. Um, I don't care about him being a great thrower because he's not. I'm not fucking arguing that at this point, but he's going to be a good enough fantasy player to the point where the fade to quarterback 31, ridiculous, okay? Let's get to the juice of this video. The juice of this video centers around a few different running backs. Young, up and coming, entering their prime, guys in which I have started to fade myself, but I've quickly realized the fade has gone a little bit too far. That's DeAndre Swift, and that's J.K. Dobbins. It's both of them. They have basically been intertwined together in where they started and where they're going right now in ADP, all right? They started the summer off as second-round picks, legitimately, you know, the 209, the 211. So you're using early-round capital on these guys as more people started to, to dive into the numbers to see that they re-signed Gus Edwards, that they signed Jamal Williams, that they have Jared Goff. As, you know, the things that changed started to change the ADPs of these players. Now, easy fade in the second round. They are moving further and further down the third round. They started to get into the early third rounds. They started to get to the mid third rounds. Both guys are late third round picks. And here is where I tell you, as soon as they clip that four mark, as soon as they are in the fourth round, which is what's going to happen in a lot of super flex leagues right now in underdog ADP, they're both uh, around pick three, nine to three twelve, And that's one quarterback leagues. They're easily in the fourth round for super flex leagues. You smash the button on that. Okay. You smash the button on that. I, I don't care what I've been saying all along. The reason that you fade them in the second round is because you look for league winning upside in the second round. I don't think Swift has it. I don't think Dobbins has it. Swift has a long way to go in order to earn our trust as the goal line back as a guy who's going to get 250 carries this year because Jamal Williams is there. J.K. Dobbins, same thing with Gus Edwards there. We don't know if he's going to catch any passes. It hurts the upside of both of these guys. When they get into the fourth round, though, these guys are explosive. These guys, Swift has... 70 catch upside jk dobbins has 12 touchdown upside things like that start to factor in when you look at the range of outcomes right this is the the bigger point here for fantasy football it's not drafting guys at their ceiling it's not drafting guys at their floor it's about figuring out what's most likely to happen right is it you know his ceiling might be rb5 his floor might be rb15 you have to start asking yourself what's the most likely scenario to happen if his ceiling is rb5 but he has a four percent chance of hitting that you don't draft him near rb5 and you start to calculate the different ceilings the different floors of every player round by round and once you do that and you start picking precisely based off those fucking mathematical numbers and your big brain starts to calculate them correctly you will make a lot of good picks because you hell you your entire roster will be weighed between ceiling and floor and ceiling and floor and you will give yourself a mix of both but if you start to choose if you start getting fancy and you start getting fucking half chubs for every single player that has upside your entire team is going to be risky so you risk and you reward and you pick based on value on those players round by round right if everything is just flashy or if everything is just floor your team is going to have a hard time scoring your team is going to have a hard time winning you're use, you're giving yourself you know a, a one in 12 chance to win this league but worse than that, because you don't have any solidified value on your team, okay? Round by round, you look at ceiling, you look at floor, and you weigh the options, okay? Most likely scenario. And for these guys, Swift and Dobbins, the upside is very, very much worth fourth-round picks. Their floor is going to be super high already. We know that. The upside is questionable, which is why not a good second-round pick, borderline third-round pick. As soon as they hit the fourth round, we smash, and that's what's happening. I'm also, I'm also, I'm also... Kind of in on Josh Jacobs this year, man. Uh, he is currently flying down ADP. Right now on underdog, he has, uh, over the last month, he's moved 10 spots downward on the underdog ADP. He is currently pick 55, which is midway through the fifth round. Again, in super flex leagues, you're inserting another 10 to 12 quarterbacks above Josh Jacobs there. So he is end of sixth round, flirting with seventh round draft capital in fantasy football super flex leagues right now. At that price... I'm in. Like, I get it. Jacobs isn't catching passes. Uh, not a lot, at least, right? We did see his targets. I think it's notable that we saw his targets jump up from 27 to 45. Like, that's a very noticeable leap. 
that no one's really talking about. The problem is he's not really explosive. Like his yards per reception went down a little bit. He's not scoring two to three receiving touchdowns. No one really notices it. He did take a jump up. Okay. Year one to year two. And that's the jump we like to see. Uh, now they had Kenyon Drake. Obviously that hurts him. That caps the ceiling. Kenyon Drake's going to take a lot of passing work. I just don't think Jacobs is ever going to be the passing down guy that we wanted him to be. Okay. Uh, you're, you're, you're drafting him for his rushing volume and his touchdown upside. And this is something I I felt like was worth noting that Graham Barfield tweeted out. Josh Jacobs is the most game script dependent running back in fantasy in wins 21.1 fantasy points per game in losses, 10.3 fantasy points per game. 17 of his 19 career touchdowns have come in wins. Raiders win total is seven and a half. Same as the Panthers and the Broncos. Okay. So, the thing with Josh Jacobs is like, you know exactly what you're getting. You're not you're not getting a guy where if they play the Chiefs and they're down 20 points by halftime, you're going to get a good game out of him. You know when, you know where to play him. And it's not exactly um, fantastic news given we don't think the Raiders are going to be a good team this year. But the weekly ceiling is there, guys. Like in wins last year, he averaged over 20 fantasy points per game. That is a massive, a massive number. And again, it's predictable which weeks you should play him. So that gives you an edge in redraft. Uh, but but Jacobs, like regardless, the volume should still be there. He should still have plenty of games where he runs the ball 18 plus times and he's going to absolutely dominate the goal line carries down there whenever Las Vegas gets there. I think Derek Carr's fine. Derek Carr's a competent quarterback that'll run an offense that scores, you know, their, their league average probably, um, which leads to a lot of Josh Jacobs goal line carries, man. Last year, he led the NFL in red zone carries, 10 zone carries and was fourth in goal line carries. OK, 64 red zone carries, 35 10 zone carries. 18 goal line carries. His efficiency last year on goal line carries was fucking whack. He scored five times on 18 goal line carries, okay? Um, And he still finished with 12 touchdowns last year, all right? Which is insane. Josh Jacobs finished with 12 rushing touchdowns last year despite converting five of 18 goal line carries. And here's the thing. Like, the Raiders were 8-8 and last year, okay? And Vegas has them at 7.5 wins this year, which I know they added an extra game, but it's around the same projection, right? I simply... Don't think that um, that the role for Jacobs is going to change that much in 2021. Like, we know what Jacobs is. He's a very, very well-rounded running back. That's what he is. He's a running back that runs the ball. If you look over the last two years, pretty consistent. Innovative tackles, breakaway runs, yards created. Top 10, top 9 in all three categories in both years that he's been in the NFL. Again, he's just a guy with good burst, good wiggle, good vision. Not going to give you breakaway runs. Not going to catch that many passes, but a very good running back. And if he stays healthy... Going to get a shitload of volume, man. He's going to get a lot of carries on the ground. It's it's like the same way that you were drafting James Conner and Todd Gurley and like, like all these guys in the third and fourth round last year. You're getting Josh Jacobs, but like four years younger than what those guys were last year at a three-round discount, okay? Uh, the obvious change here also that I know you guys are going to point out is the offensive line. They lost Rodney Hudson. They lost some pieces this, uh, this year. They let go of a lot of players. But to be honest, they weren't good last year, okay? Uh, Jacobs ranked... Okay, and also, last time I plugged this stat, a lot of you guys were confused. So on Player Profiler, they have this statistic that says run blocking efficiency. When you go onto a player's page, a running back's page, it says run blocking efficiency for that player. For Josh Jacobs, he ranked 72nd. A lot of you guys were like, hey, there's only 32 teams in the league. How's your rank? Because it's 72nd amongst running backs in the NFL. There are more than 72 running backs in the NFL. Okay, motherfucker. So don't come at me when you don't know what you're talking about or what you're saying. So you go to player profiler, you type in Josh Jacobs, and you'll see run blocking efficiency with 72nd amongst all running backs. Okay, which means 71 running backs received better run blocking efficiency when those guys were on the field than Josh Jacobs last year. PFF had Las Vegas ranked 26th in run blocking efficiency, and they're 26th heading into 2021. So my point here is Josh Jacobs was fine for fantasy last year. You knew when to play him. You you knew when not to play him. Took a jump up in the receiving game. Kenyon Drake is added to the mix, so it hurts a little bit. He's going to dominate early down carries. He's going to dominate goal line carries. He's been the same running back that we thought he was. Elusive, wiggle, broken tackle guy, breakaway run kind of guy. Not Hail Mary, but breakaway run type of guy. And this team is pretty much the same setup as they were last year. They did use a first round pick on dude Leatherwood, which is looked like a fucking terrible pick, but who knows, you know, if you want to look at it objectively, some of us are wrong a lot. <clears throat> Leatherwood might be good. Who fucking knows? But, uh, but yeah, I mean, listen, the, the team is projected to probably be around the same team that they were last year. And I think Josh Jacobs was fine. Thus as a sixth, seventh round pick, he will be fine. So will Jarvis Landry, man. He's like the wide receiver 46 or some shit. In in underdog ADP, he's like a ninth, tenth round pick. 
And the way I look at Jarvis Landry, and I just tweeted it out this morning. I'm going to pull that tweet up, actually. So give me, give me about 13 seconds for you. Hey, there we go. There we go, my guy. Uh, that ain't it. Nope. Hey, while we're uh, while I'm fucking doing something that I should have been doing ten minutes ago, can you just do me a huge favor? Just scroll down, hit the thumbs up button, and subscribe to the channel if you are new. We're doing videos like this every fucking day. Jarvis Landry PPR points per game historically. All right, 2015 sixteen point eight, 2016 fourteen point six, 2017 sixteen point five. 2018, 13.4, 2019, 14.8. Very consistently between 13 and a half and 16 and a half fantasy points per game. Okay. Now you look at 2020, and in my opinion, in my opinion, the big, the big storyline of the Brown season, offensively and statistically, has to revolve around the three games in which they were literally playing in like hurricane weather. There was three weeks in a row in which Baker Mayfield averaged 12 pass completions per game. There's three games in which you can completely wipe off the slate if you're going to look at per game efficiency, per game statistics for the Cleveland Browns. Every other game is normal. There was three games in which the weather was so bad that he completed 12 passes per game. Okay. And when we take those outs, here are Jarvis Landry's per game numbers. Take out the three games where there was ridiculous weather. Half PPR, 10.8. PPR, 13.4. Receptions were there. The targets were there. The receiving yards were there. He is, he was exactly who he was every other year, but we're looking at those three bad games where he went for like four fantasy points a game and everyone has that stuck in their mind, but I'm here to tell you Jarvis Landry is still exactly who Jarvis Landry has been, okay? Had it not been for those three weather games. The other thing I want to pick up, I know a lot of you guys are going to be like, well, Odell Beckham missed the entire year and he couldn't take off. Here's the thing, like Jarvis Landry has been the same player with or without Odell Beckham on the field over the last two years. Look at the split games where Odell Beckham played, 7.65 7.65 targets games where he where he didn't play 7.75 so he literally averaged 0. 0.1 targets more per game without Odell Beckham on the field the involvement doesn't change. they're two completely different players where they do not intertwine in terms of the volume in this passing offense it is still completely a, a funnel passing offense they they drafted Anthony Schwartz but he's like a speedster he's not a guy who's going to come in and command a ton of targets they don't really have a lot of playmakers in the passing game outside of Odell and Jarvis Landry, and who knows what the fuck Odell is at this point anymore. He's old. He has suffered a lot of injuries that have been serious. Uh, I know Jarvis is not fun. He's not fancy. He's not sexy. But listen, 10 half PPR fantasy points per game at like wide receiver 45. I also, again, I think Baker's in for a big year. I think we're sleeping on him because of those points per game, because of the weather games or whatever. I think he could bring back some nice passing touchdown numbers. Like he did his, remember his rookie year? He was out and fucking firing. He set the record for rookie touchdown passes in a season. Like I don't think we've seen the prime of Baker. And uh, with a little bit of luck, with a little bit of touchdown luck, and some of them going to Jarvis's way, I think he could finish with six, seven, maybe eight touchdowns and perfectly fine in the 10th round of your draft. So Jarvis Landry, the fade has gone too far. As has it with, I've been on record many times, and I'm probably going to sound like a huge fucking asshole in about a month when Aaron Rodgers winds up in Denver. I hate that I had to say that. But this entire Green Bay offense, and more specifically, Robert Tunyon, okay? Aaron Jones is like an early second round pick. Devontae Adams, same thing. So the fade, I think, is you're getting a lot of value there, but I don't think they're getting like wiped off the board completely. But Robert fucking Tunyon, man. I am assuming I am drafting in my underdog drafts. Uh, If you're not an underdog, it's the best way to prepare for your drafts. Uh, They're best ball. So you're literally just drafting like 100 teams. You don't have to do any in season management. Underdog Fantasy, the link to download the app will be right in my description. It'll be one of the first things in there. Um, and they're three dollar drafts, which means everyone's taking the drafts extremely seriously. The ADP is on fucking point, like a ballpoint pen, and uh, and thus you get to really prepare for the season. And uh, if you download the app and you deposit ten dollars and you use the promo code BDGE when you do so, BDGE, you're getting twenty five dollars on top of your account. is beautiful, and you could take advantage of Tunyon's unbelievable ADP of. Hold, hold, I had it up here. I fucked, this is the one thing I fucked up. He was tight end 13. He's tight end 13 right now. Pick 135 on underdog. That is insane value for Robert Tunyon right now. He is exactly what you look for in a breakout tight end in terms of, he already, he broke out last year. He was a fucking tight end three in fantasy football. 
but people are sleeping on him as if he hasn't broken out. So I'm going to anoint him another fucking breakout year. Okay. This is exactly what you look for when you look at a breakout tight end yards. Like, you, you, okay. So the volume wasn't there, right? The volume wasn't there. The touchdowns were there. So people are like, there's no way he can, this is the storyline for Tunyon. The overall volume wasn't there. The touchdowns were at an absurd rate. He scored an unbelievable amount of touchdowns, which is why he was the tight end three. So people are like, oh, well, his touchdowns have to regress. Therefore, he's not a good pick in fantasy football. This is the same argument we made with Darren Waller. Why? He was a great pick because people thought they added weapons, so he was going to get less volume, thus he wasn't going to be a good pick. But what we knew about Waller was that he was wildly efficient on the volume that he did get. Okay, So when you look at Robert Tunyon, he wasn't just scoring touchdowns. Yards per target, number three amongst tight end. Yards per route run, number seven. His catch rate and true catch rate, number one. He had zero, zero drops on the season. Target separation, number one amongst tight ends. Target premium, number one. He was extremely efficient outside of just touchdowns, yards, yards per target, yards per route run amongst the fuck um, amongst all tight ends last year. All right. He's coming off a monster year and a lot of that is touchdown relevant, but that's what's going to happen when Aaron Rodgers is your quarterback. He has an extremely high touchdown rate. You give him one of his biggest targets in the red zone, Robert Tunyon is going to score a lot of fucking touchdowns, okay? And here's the thing. Like, we keep trying to force these these tight ends. Like, we keep trying to project a breakout before it happens, and now we're getting to project a breakout for a, a second breakout when we already saw it happen. Like, we're, we're, we, we've we already been shown. Like, Gary Vee always talks about, like, I don't predict things. You know, he's always on top of social media, NFTs, all these things that happen. He's talking about TikTok like years in advance, but he's like, I don't predict these things. They've already happened in the market and I just get louder about them, right? I'm not the one, I'm not fucking Nostradamus. I'm telling you what I've seen already. Thus, I play into it. You know, with guys like Jay Stern, Sternberger, all the tight ends that we've seen in Green Bay, those are always projections. They come into the year without any production the year prior. We just saw a monster fucking year at Robert Tunyon. I'm showing you that he already did it. And now we're getting to draft him as if we haven't seen him do it yet. All right. So Robert Tunyon is quickly becoming my favorite tight end value in fantasy football this year and an absolute must draft players, an absolute must draft player for me. He's got the full time role now, right? There's no committee there at tight end. There's no question about who's going to be playing. There's no question about who the third target in this offense is, right? It's Demonte Adams, it's Aaron Jones, it is Robert Tunyon now. And this is going to lead to a lot more volume. And the Green Bay coaching staff is excited about Robert Tunyon. Matt LaFleur says he wants to feature Robert Tunyon in the offense more in 2021. It says Tunyon has improved more than anyone on the team since he became head coach in 2019. So you have volume, efficiency, a high-scoring offense, an elite, accurate quarterback, Little, little target competition. Again, they didn't bring in anything besides Amari Rodgers. Like, they didn't bring a free agent wide receiver in. This could be a monster year for Tunyon. I'm telling you, as a tight end 13, you have to be drafting this dude fucking everywhere. Everywhere. And those are the top five players in which I believe the fade has gone too far. Drop in the comment section who you feel the fade has simply gone too far in. Right now, 2021 Fantasy Football Drafts. Again, the sharpest ADP is on Underdog. So if you want to go to the link and check out the ADP before you come bike and comment on who you think the fade has gone too far on, I feel like a fucking MC up here, that'd be beautiful. Okay? So check the ADP out on Underdog. Download the app. Use promo code BDG when you deposit 10. Come back. Let me know who your fades are, who fades have gone too far on. Hit the thumbs up while you're down there. Subscribe to the channel while you're new. I'm out. Love you. Bye.